Okay, we're very fortunate to have uh, Sandy Pentland with us today. Uh, he's from MIT, as I know you all know already, and uh, the author of uh, uh, Social Physics, and, and a, uh, been an associate with the Media Lab for a long, long time, and knew that now the new Institute for Data Systems and Society. <clears throat> uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And uh, so I asked him uh, at breakfast, what was an unusual thing I could say about him? And he told me that his first job was counting the number of beavers in outer space. So I Googled that because I wanted to be smart enough to introduce you. And it turns out the number is Avogadro's number, <laughs> which is just really rather amazing. Sandy, it's all yours. <laughs> OK. <laughs> cool. I'll have a guidance number. That's amazing. That is a, yeah. The, the, the trick is actually that beavers make ponds, and ponds you can see from outer space. So, um, all right. So, what I thought I would do is emphasize the role of data and new data sources in making policy and in science. Um, and give just a couple of examples and mention some of the modeling along the way. So, um, oops, got a do this this way. No. So I'm going to start my story uh, here about 20 years ago uh, when we saw that computing was becoming ubiquitous and we were going to have wireless communication. We didn't have Wi-Fi yet, right? And we didn't have cell phones. There were no cell phones. And so what I helped do is put together a bunch of students, about 20 students, who wore little backpacks with motorcycle batteries and had a little laser thing that you know projected letters on your eyeball and it was all pretty weird and and but we got to see a lot of what would happen in today's world where we run around with cell phones and and Fitbits and things like that. One of the first things that we discovered when we built this stuff is everybody thought it was interesting and everybody said they wouldn't wear it. So uh, I hooked up with a fashion school in Paris, uh, and we designed what wearables in the future would look like. And what's interesting here is, is that it looks like Google Glass there up in the corner. And in fact, one of the students went on to be the technical lead for Google Glass. And it looks sort of like an iPad. And well, look at the sort of people that sponsored the research. The thing that we learned from this, though, other than you know having our fashion students design all the stuff that we carry around with us, is we learned that you get data about human behavior, constant streams of data, breadcrumbs that people leave behind. And what this does is this lets you begin to understand patterns of human behavior in a way that was never before possible. We had 20 people who we could monitor millisecond by millisecond for a year. And they would interact. And that had never happened before. And so we began modeling them. And just to give you a sense of why that matters, let me just show you something that's a sort of a qualitative thing. But you know, this is duration of observation. So this is like 30 years, something like that. This is uh, half an hour or so. And this is number of measurements per person per minute. This is almost all of social science, political science, the data for economics. Like take the Framingham Heart Study, which is you know 30 years, 30,000 people, I think it is. They only sample people every few years. So it's about one number per month per person. OK. Well, you don't know if those guys are out eating you know, at McDonald's every day or not, because that's not in the survey. The context is missing. And so what we do is we're looking at these new rich data sources and running experiments just like these. So we try to use the best from social science, from economics. But now we have context. We measure everything we can so that we can look at how things interact. And it's really quite different. And this is, you know, sort of the panopticon where you can see everything. So that's the theme of what I'm saying here is I think the biggest thing we need going forward is rich data, not necessarily big, but where the context is measured, where things can actually be controlled for because you measured them, <laughs> not just because you randomized. And there's a longer discussion there. 
So today's wearables look like this. This is something we build. It just sort of clips on your clothes. Uh, but any of the IoT stuff fits in this, Internet of Things stuff. Um, and of course, the ubiquitous cell phone. You know, we live in a world now where the majority of adult humans have cell phones and use them all the time. You know, the data are that um, most people are within a meter of their cell phone 24 hours a day. Think about that, right? And of course, these things have location, they have audio, they have cameras, they have Bluetooth to know who else is around, they have accelerometers to know how they're moving, and so on and so forth. And you can do a lot of fun things, like we showed recently, uh, and this is in a database of around a million people, that you can tell people's personality from the way they use their cell phone, right? People who are outgoing are different than people who are uh, introverts. Neuroticism is a funny one. And in fact, actually, you can do better than humans do in judging personality. So if you ask people to judge personality, it turns out your cell phone knows your personality better than your best friend. Um, here's another one. We looked at people negotiating uh, uh, solutions. Um, something called the Mission Survival Task, developed by NASA to look at group behavior. It turns out that without listening to the words and without knowing the language, you can tell who's the protagonist, who's the supporter, who's the attacker, who's providing information, who's not, and so forth, about as well as humans can when they're given the full video and the full audio. And what that tells you is that we have very stereotyped modes of acting, and that suggests that really our modes of interaction are things that are biologically quite ancient. That we had signaling behavior long before we had language, that's sort of indisputable, but that we've carried that signaling behavior over into our modern life. And that's what it means to be somebody who is dominant, somebody who's pushy, somebody who's introverted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we judge these things. You can also do other things which are interesting. So this is little devices on people in a German bank. And we're looking at the blue, which is the pattern of email, and then the red, which is the pattern of face-to-face -face communication. And it turns out that you can actually read out the patterns of productivity, get estimates of rate of innovation from this without knowing the words or the subject matter. It's a little bit different in different areas. but Innovation has to do with cross-group fertilization, just like you sort of thought it did, okay? Um, productivity has to do with in-group communication. And we have nice little mathematical formulas that you can get from that. So that's all fun and games, but you can use it in various ways. I just want to mention this because there might be people that are interested. So we've used the results from things like this to build a distance education tool. Um, so you all familiar with distance education, right? Another word for it is bad TV, right? <laughs> I'm like, come on, get real, right? And so what I did is I said, well, you know, actually in executive education what we do is we talk for a couple minutes, just a couple of minutes, and then we have people at tables, experienced, interesting people who are the students, and we have them talk to each other. They learn from each other, peer-to-peer -peer learning it's a huge thing in learning. And we don't do it in distance education. So we built a tool that takes that distance education stuff and then breaks you know, the 1,000 people that are online into groups of four or five and incidentally gives them feedback about behaving themselves so nobody dominates and uh, other, everybody participates and so forth. And the initial sort of um, thing that we can do will handle 1,000 groups a day. So we'll have millisecond by millisecond measurements of all the interactions in a thousand groups. And I would submit that that's probably more data than is gotten by all of the academic literature in a year. It's in that ballpark per day. And it's on a very fine grain rather than on a, oh, we did a survey at the end. Ought to change what we understand about groups. 
And some initial results show that we're likely to get about 50 to 100% better retention. Well, that's a big change, right? OK, so some things to begin. This is, as I understood it, about data modeling and policy. So let's talk about that. So the things I've talked about so far are sort of individual things or dyadic interactions, small group things. Let's talk about some larger types of things. Um, so this is people moving around in San Francisco. Um, the black dots, uh, uh, these are cell phones. The big black dots are most popular bars and restaurants and so forth. And if you analyze this, what you discover is what looks like a nicely mixed city is actually composed of subgroups that spend time with each other but not with the other groups. So it's as if there are these different subgroups that are superimposed on each other. And in fact, if you stratify people by these subgroups, you discover that you can that they have very homogeneous characters. So one group, like this um, uh, bright green group there, has something like an order of magnitude higher risk of alcohol poisoning. Another group has something like a factor of five bigger risk of diabetes. We don't exactly know why. It's not any particular behavior, but it's the ensemble behaviors for this group that spends time together, learns from each other, and shows very, character uh, very similar characteristics. Same is true for shopping behavior, for credit behavior, uh, for voting behavior, things like that. In fact, it's much more powerful than demographics. Um, recent results with a city uh, in uh, Europe show that this is at least three times more powerful at stratifying people than demographics. So all of our city, you know zip code? Everything runs off of zip code, right? The demographics for different places. You know, it's this many women, this many men, this income, and stuff like that. What this is telling you is that that's a lousy way to stratify the population. And of course, policy built on that is going to be lousy too. What you want to build policy on are things like choices people made. What we're stratifying on are the choices of where people go who they associate with, and that gives you much better insight into who they are. Building policy on that will be much more accurate and effective. The fundamental insight about this stuff, though, is really interesting. Um, so we have uh, about 100 million, six years of credit card data for about 100 million Americans. You should think about that. I was like, Nobody ever laughs. <laughs> So this is you, OK? And I can tell you how I got the data later. Don't worry, it's not, a, not really scary. But what everybody shows, and this is true anywhere in the world that we've looked, is, is that there's a variation between sort of daily patterns. So the big balls mean you do this a lot. In this case, these are, you, you buy something here very frequently. And the big arrows mean that after you buy here, you often buy something over here, grocery store, gas store. Right? Or maybe you just come back the next and buy something more at the grocery store. And that this is extraordinarily predictable. Um, and that every once in a while, people break loose and they explore. And this is completely unpredictable by normal statistical modeling tools. Um, in physics, you would call these levy flights. But there's another model for it, which is much more interesting. And that is. Um, it comes from financial portfolio theory, where you're looking at what's called multi-armed bandits. It turns out that if you look at these people as exploring their environment, and you're, they're looking at all the different options, those are the bandits, trying to figure out what's good, that this is something called Thompson sampling in the aggregate, not in the individual, which is a, an optimal Bayesian strategy for exploring your environment and finding the most valuable resources in your environment. That's something you would expect people to do. Because, in fact, you see animals doing this uh, as well. So evolutionarily, a very old characteristic of animals. And it requires two things. It requires this 
sort of exploration where, in fact, things you try are tried uh, with a frequency that's proportional to the expected posterior utility. Um, and uh, what that does is it lets you very quickly converge to the optimal uh, uh, exploitation of your environment. That's sort of a nice thing. In fact, actually, um, because the convergence is, at, uh, is optimally fast, it can handle non-stationary things for the people who care about this. And you can handle what alpha stable distributions, which are the long tail distributions, which are things that standard methods can't, just for those of you who are into this sort of thing. Um, but let me show you some of the things that you can do with this. So what am I talking about? Is I'm talking about very old behavior. So this is an example of going out and exploring, <laughs> okay? And the women do this too. I lived with Aborigines for a very short time. Uh, the women's hunt better than the men, I'll tell you. I, I could do what the men could do, but I couldn't do what the women could do. Um, and then they engage with each other and they trade stories about where the food is, how things are, challenges, and so forth. And that's what we're talking about is a group-based sampling of the environment. Individuals go out and sample, proportional to posterior. They do it erratically because there's too many options. But by combining information, they can get a good picture of the overall resource dis distribution in the area. Okay, well, that's cool that you see this in credit card data and you see it in telephone data. You see it in call data, mobility data, where people go. Uh, you see it in financial data, day trading and so forth, same model. Um, but here's an interesting thing. It turns out that if you look at people's behavior in terms of their sampling, this exploration uh, habits trade-off, some people are out of whack. And if you look at those people for a period of time, you find out that they typically get into financial trouble sometime in the next couple of months. In fact, we can beat banks by about 50% without looking at what the people are buying, just by looking at their patterns of exploration. When people are stressed, they change how they interact with their environment. And in fact, actually, they change how they interact with the environment in the presence of disease, too. So when we looked at a community for a year, and we kept track of when they had flu, and we asked them depression questions and things like that, we found that the same type of signal could be used to detect when they were coming down with a disease, either flu, depression, sometimes food poisoning. And they were characteristic disruptions, too, which is interesting. Um, so in terms of policy, Todd Park, who's the chief technical officer of the United States, said, this is something that will save our health care system. What he meant is that um, if you can find when people are getting sick, whether they're right at the beginning of getting sick, then you can reach out to them and you can intervene. And you're much more likely to be successful if you do that, and it's going to be a whole lot cheaper, almost an order of magnitude cheaper. Okay? Now, we haven't gotten this actually to work, but Kaiser Permanente, I mean, it worked as well as Todd thought, anyhow, but Kaiser Permanente, which is the largest vertically integrated health service in the United States, uses this uh, is the largest investor in this, uses it to be able to look at chronic patients who are at high risk for um, reversion of various sorts, for incidents, and it's like a check engine light. When someone with diabetes or somebody with chronic uh, heart failure shows a change in their uh, exploratory behavior, they give them a call. All right? Simple sort of intervention changes things rather dramatically. You can do this same sort of thing at scale. So this is a, a data from Foursquare for 300 cities, 150 in the US, uh, 150 in Europe. And what we looked at was the amount of exploration that people did in the different cities. And then we plotted that. So exploration that resulted in face-to-face -face meetings, okay? So exploration that resulted in information transfer of some sort. Might have just been talking about the football game. We don't know, okay? But if you plot that 
versus GDP per square mile, you find an interesting relationship. In fact, it accounts for about 90% of the variance in the United States. You can get the same relationship for patents. You can get the same sort of relationship for startups and startup investment. What it argues is, is that this exploration for opportunities that we see in hunter-gatherers is still operating in modern society, but now finding opportunities, spreading opportunities results in startups, increased GDP, and so forth. Now this is not, yes? What is the social science agency definition of data? What is that? I said it's four-square data, check-in data. Four so it's when people check in with each other, so I'm with my friend, so and forth. Right. So we know where they live, we know where they check in, we know where the other person lives, so we can look at the pattern of stuff, okay? This is not a really causal uh, model, okay? This is, this is correlational. We have a lot of data that argue that it is causal, but this data is not it, <laughs> okay? On the other hand, there's enough other things about this that some of my friends are using this to begin to design what would happen if you changed the transportation structure within a city. You notice that Europe and the US had different slopes in that graph, and that's a reflection of the different transportation infrastructure in Europe and the US. In fact, you could read out the average commute time from that slope, which is something to do with, you know, how many people can you get to within an hour in your environment? It's different in Europe than the U.S. So they said, well, gee, if that's the case, then what can we do? Well, we could look at London, where they happen to live. They're thinking about putting in a new subway. What is that going to do in terms of moving London? Let me move back here from here up to there, right? What would be the expected increase in GDP? And they made nice little graphs of this. So this is the proposed line. You see green things are where they expect GDP per kilometer to go up. Red things are where they expect it to go down. And so on the basis of that, they argued for having a north-south line to sort of balance off the places that go down. Now, if you think about this for a minute, you can criticize this in various ways. But what we're talking about is something that's actually pretty revolutionary in public policy. We are talking about designing infrastructure to improve GDP. It's not, oh, this would be really good and people will like it. It's not, oh, yeah, well, greater access and maybe that will result in, no. There's actually a mathematical model of how transportation turns into GDP. Now, you can criticize the model, okay? But this is showing that you can build stuff like this once we have this data, okay? So what we should do is the experiment. We should build the subway, and we'll go back and ask, how does this really work out? Is this a good prediction? If not, what in the model do we have to change? That's a really revolutionary change, I think, in the way we do policy. Here's another thing we did in London. So I talked to O2, the carrier there, and the Open Data Institute to release data about crime uh, in and about uh, movement within London during the, the holiday periods, the, the Christmas periods. And what we discovered was is that the crime hotspots could be predicted very highly accurately. Now, it's not people, it's hotspots. This square, this neighborhood will have a crime spike by um, changes in the mix of people in the square. So if you have a square, right, people from neighboring towns typically go to that square, right? If that changes, if that mix of different people changes, that's a sign that something's happened there, and that induces stress, and about 50% of the time, that stress resolves as crime. The other 50%, it's a good thing. So you don't really know. But what this tells you is this tells you this mixing, this exploration between different populations has a really concrete effect in terms of social change. And some of those social changes are bad. Some of them are good. So let me show you our sort of current idea about using this, which is 
let's go crazy. <laughs> um, and this is uh, the Kavli Human Project, and it's led by uh, Paul Glimcher at NYU. Um, I'm just helping him with instrumenting it and figuring out what to do and causing problems, as, as I usually do. And the Kavli Project is uh, really amazing. We are going to watch everything that 10,000 people in New York City do for a period of 30 years. Okay. So uh, this includes things like putting Bluetooth beacons in the underwear of the kids so we can know how close they are to their parents and whether they eat dinner with their parents. Why? Because that's thought to be important in child development. It's important, thought to be important in the development of families and the stability of families. But there really isn't enough data and in particular the right sort of data, to be able to resolve that and set public policies that will encourage things. So we're going to do that. Let me just show you an example of the sort of data we're going to collect. And I'm not going to spend detailed time about this. So this is the space. Scale of measurement is vertical. Age of subjects is horizontal. And different sort of domains which have to do with essentially the sort of scale of, of analysis are also roughly correlated with the scale of measurement. So this is the sort of things that we've evolved as a society, are funded by NIH, are funded by uh, NSF. And what you see is, is that, you know, brain functional connectivity, yeah, well, pretty good. Genotype, well, actually, we don't do that except occasionally. Uh, education history, well, only when p kids are young. Uh, crime we take care of in middle life. Um, but there's a lot of blue space where we're not doing very much. And that's important, not just because it's not being studied, but because you can't know the connections between, for instance, um, uh, your, your biome, your internal gut bacteria, and cancer. Why? Because you don't have both of those in the same person. Or the connection between child behavior and genome in schools. You need to have all of those things in the same person for a longitudinal study. And so what this is really doing is defining the gold standard of what it means to be healthy and how health breaks down into disease. And it's really amazing that, you know, the science of medicine is the science of disease. It's not the science of health. You've heard that all the time, right? But what this is doing is this is saying, we need to make a science of health. We need to know what typical people do. And incidentally, the sampling is uh, uh, the correct sampling to correctly represent all the different ethnic, racial, age types throughout New York City. And we hope to do it in other cities. And what that will do is give a sampling of the space that looks a little more like this. So some of it's still episodic, like RNA, microbiome, things like that. But it will give us, for the first time, a really complete picture of entire lifespans. And you know, if you came to this sort of de novo, you'd say, well, yeah, of course. This is the first thing you do to find out about humans. But we've never done it. And in fact, on some readings, the NIH charter says this is the sort of thing they can't do. So NIH is doing some specific things in here, but mostly it's private money. Just saying. Here are some things we do. So participants, questionnaire, documents. See, sir, I'm going down the middle here. Surveys, sensors for air quality, ambient noise. Those will be continuous for the 30 years. Public data sets on census, education, law, uh, movement, food, diaries, transportation, structural interviews, so basically every sort of psychological test you could imagine. Um, physical exam, weight, height, plume, by, by, blood chemistry for genetics, urine sample, saliva sample, hair sample, biome, stool sample, 
EMRs. Turns out New York has a very consistent uh, uh, electronic medical record <laughs> system, so you can get everybody. Uh, prescriptions, health insurance, chemical exposure, MRI, you know, let's see, education databases, surveys, uh, vita, you know, where they work, W-2, tax forms, Bluetooth-based presence in uh, participants' home. I told you about the underwear already. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Smartphone app for everything you do through your smartphone. Uh, stuff inside the house so you know when people are eating together and when they're not and when they're sleeping and when they're not. Uh, financial, bank, credit card records, bank records, title ownership, public assistance records, uh, uh, call history, all the cop stuff. Okay, so that's what we're going to get. Got a, you got a picture, right? <laughs> it's <was> expensive. <laughs> okay, Paul's amazing. He's like raising all his money. It's really amazing. Um, but what that should give you at the end, what that hopefully give us, is really a sense of what it means to be healthy for different groups in, in New York. And at the end, of course, we hope to be able to do it in lots of other cities. Uh, so just saying. OK, so, so I've talked about the health stuff. Let me talk about some other stuff that we've done. So when we realized that we could do stuff like use phone records or use other sorts of records to do mapping of poverty, turns out that works really well. You heard about Ebola. You can track infectious disease using these sorts of records because of changes in behavior, because a lot of infectious disease travels by a people. So if you know how they interact, uh, you can do things. And so we've done a number of experiments. Uh, the main one is with Orange. The first one was in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so what we did is we got all of the phone records and all of the UN records and all the CIA records and all that, everything else we could get for the entire country for a month. And we put that together and we aggregated it so that it was anonymous and couldn't be re-identified. Um, and then we put out a call and got 100 academic groups from around the world to figure out what you could do with this sort of rich context data for an entire country. Turns out you could do a lot. I've told you a little bit about it. I'll show you just a little bit. Um, working with Telefonica, where I sit with the board of directors, we did a datathon in London. You saw the uh, crime stuff that came from that. Um, Senegal, same thing as Cote d'Ivoire, but a couple years later, uh, we had our sort of systems down a little better. Uh, and some of my buddies um, that uh, we have a collaboration used our tools in Italy, northern Italy. So we actually have the most amazing data set you can imagine from northern Italy, which includes mobility, call patterns, medical records, purchase records, um, financial records, government records for the entire population. Now, it's not individual records. It's aggregate records. But from that, you can tell a lot. So for instance, some of the things from these big, big um, meetings that we have, where we, like I said, there's hundreds of academic units that come together. You know, we figure out things like um, poverty level. Turns out that people's mixing that exploration predicts their poverty level really, really well. In England, for instance, the R squared is 0.85. That's like awesome. Um, Optimize transportation infrastructure, figuring out where the buses ought to go, because they don't know, actually. They don't know where people live and work. <coughs> and so, for instance, in Cote d'Ivoire, we were able to improve the, the uh, transportation system by some 10% just by rerouting the buses, because they didn't know where the people lived, where they worked, where the buses were supposed to go. It's not magic. This is just data. Um, optimize the electric grid. Well, the same thing. Where are the people? If you don't know where the people are and where they go, you don't know where to put an electric grid out, and you don't know how to roll out your various sorts of infrastructure investment. Um, here's malaria. Uh, other diseases can be the same. Because, of course, um, infectious disease, you can understand. It's people interacting with people. Malaria, malaria there are reservoirs, physical reservoirs, where the, the mosquitoes live. And you can backtrack and say, well, people who are getting malaria Actually, all were right here, and that must be where the mosquitoes are. Right? And so you can go in and, and look at things. 
any rate, so those are some of the things. We've developed an infrastructure for this which allows companies to contribute data for the public good. It's called OPAL, which stands for Open Algorithms. Um, and the idea is not to do data sharing of raw data, but to share only aggregate data that's useful for doing these sorts of things. And um, this is the result of those experiments in Cote d'Ivoire, in Italy, in England, in Senegal. And uh, it's gotten a lot of reception in Europe as a way to bring private data into the public sphere. Most of the data that we can use to make our society better is not government data. It's private data from telcos, from banks, from drugstores, from transportation companies, et cetera, et cetera. And today, there's no good way for them to contribute data into the public good. And that's what we're trying to, to build here with funding from Orange, uh, from the French government, the World Bank, uh, Paris 21. So if you're interested in that. Um, this effort has had some practical policy effect. So about a year and a half ago, I was asked to be on uh, this special committee by the UN Secretary General um, as they forged their new uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, what he called was this type of things that I've just shown you, he referred to as the data revolution, um, which led to amusing stories like showing up at the UN, you know, well, what are you here for? So oh, I'm a data revolutionary, right? And you know the cops pull out their guns. <laughs> you know, no, 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 that's what. Yeah. You know. Anyway, um, so what has been enacted into the um, Sustainable Development Goals uh, as a result of this effort is a commitment by every nation on Earth to measure 171 KPIs, indicators of health, inequality, genocide. Uh, forced movements, environmental degradation, using things like I've just shown you, together with government data, of course. And um, it might actually happen. Uh, and the reason it happened is people are, might actually happen is uh, donor countries are really tired of pumping a lot of money into uh, recipient companies, countries, sorry, uh, and not seen any results. So they want to measure what happens with their development poverty relief investments. So they want to demand, they're beginning to demand that these sorts of data measurements be used regularly so that they know whether their hundreds of millions of dollars of poverty alleviation are actually having any effect or not. Because today, you don't know. Right. I think this is really interesting. Let me, let me sort of give the example that inspired this. So it was two things. One is the fact that you can now measure stuff like this. It's not, it's a very noisy measurement. You have to be careful. It can be biased. It can have lots of problems. But you can actually measure it. And you can measure it cheaply and quickly. Um, one of the things that inspired me in this is a friend that uh, grew up in, uh, uh, in um, Sao Paulo. And he got them to change the, the constitution of Sao Paulo to do the following. If you run for mayor there, you have to write down your promises of what you will do. And if you get elected, they appoint independent commissions to evaluate you on those promises every six months. Every people are laughing. Accountable politics? How could that happen? Right? Oh my God, it's, it's really hard to imagine. This is accountable politics. It's a baby step. But now every country on Earth has promised that they will measure all these indicators of public health, of sustainability, of justice. Uh, let's see if they do it. Okay, it's a good step to go in. So um, let me end up with one other thing, which is. A lot of this depends on having access to data and that bad things don't happen to data. So when you're talking about humans, privacy is, of course, a huge thing. And in this country, we don't think too much about systematic abuse of data. 
But if you, believe, if you lived in Rwanda, you would. If you lived in uh, Syria, you would think about what happens when the government goes bad? What data do they have about you? Um, in this country, we would m worry mostly about rogue companies that you know, exploit us and try to get us to buy Big Macs or whatever. I shouldn't say that. Um, but that sort of thing. And so there's a real need for technology to protect both privacy um, and the security of this data. We also live in an environment with increasing cyber attacks. Um, and those are really serious. I don't know if you people sort of realize that. I didn't take it all that serious until somebody pointed out to me a, a very simple little fact, which is that in all of our cities, uh, we distribute power through these 12,000 volt transformers. They're supposed to last about 30 years. Since they last so long, there's only a few of them that are in reserve because they basically never break, right? But you could make something like the Stuxnet virus, right? That could take out, say, most of the transformers in the Northeast. And the power would be down for three to four months if that happens. Now, that's three to four. How much food is there in Washington, D.C.? You know? About three days, right? How do hospitals work? Well, they use electricity. What happens when the electricity goes away from all the hospitals? And on and on and on. It would be bad. Lots and lots and lots of people would die. So we need to take this as a really sort of first-rate threat when we're talking about algorithms and data and things like that. Sorry to be a bummer, but it's true. Um, and so we've been working on this, as have others. Um, this is sort of the current state of these things. I talked about OPAL, which does aggregate data for the public good. Um, it still revolves around this model, which almost all organizations use. Somebody asks for something, you compute something with the data that was in there, and it's behind the firewall. Well, we know how well this works, right? And the answer is it doesn't. Okay. Um, so what we've been doing is we've developed methods for computing on encrypted data. So the data is never decrypted. That means the NSA can't get at it. Seriously, right? Um, which is another thing to debate in terms of policy. And it uses a blockchain, not the Bitcoin blockchain, but the sorts of things that are being developed by IBM and Google and so forth to make an immutable, uncorruptible ledger of all the accesses and uses of the data. And what this means is now is, is that the data goes only where you mean to put it and only for the things that they have permission and you have an immutable record should they somehow figure out ways to do it. It's pretty interesting. And here are some uh, quotes that sort of show how interesting. Um, so we changed the world. <laughs> Health and Human Services. Um, the last one is the one that's actually the key to understanding this, which is that what systems like this do is they let you take data that you can't share because somebody else owns it or it's private or something like that and compute answers from it. So today, the reason, the primary reason, according to the US's Chief data scientist. You didn't know we had one of those, did you? There is one. <laughs> He's a nice guy. Um, the primary reason our health system is so screwed up is we can't share data. Because the data is owned by this person or that person or this other person, uh, you know, the x-ray guy or the hospital or whatever. And the picture of you can't be put together to give you services, treatments that work. I mean, and, and the obvious sort of thing with that is we don't know what procedures really work. We don't know what hospitals are good. Do you know how mind-bogglingly stupid that is? <laughs> it's like crazy. It's because we can't do it. So what Loris Lessig, who's sort of the leading light uh, in the Harvard Law School, says, what this sort of system does is make it use, possible to use and maintain data. In other words, to make the comparisons to improve systems, to do the sort of modeling you're talking about without 
holding the data. That means without owning the data. Okay? So you can have private data. You're not sharing the data. What you're doing is you're computing answers off of it, and it doesn't break any laws. So banks can, for instance, ask, well, we have all this private data, which are where people are invested, right? And we can't share that. This is the way it is today, which means we can't tell you, for instance, things like how much of all the investments we have are in credit default swaps. Now, that little question resulted in the 2007-2008 disaster. The fact that they couldn't instrument the risk in the system because privacy and ownership laws kept them from sharing data. What this does is let them compute that. Now, it's early days, there'll be other systems. But you ought to think about this, because you need to share data to be able to do these sort of policy things. And the OPAL system, the simple version of that, even, even non-technical legislators could understand OPAL, right? Um, this is way more complicated, but it really changes the legal ground. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Truly inspiring. Um, quick comment and a, and a question. Um, as an economist, and I even hire engineers, if you can believe that, we like numbers because we like to optimize things, just as you suggested. Trouble is, I work in government, and every time we come up with a solution say, this is optimal, my colleagues in public health come back with one word that says, yes, but we're not going to do it. That word is, Yes, but it's not equitable or it's not fair in our lights right. or our part. Warm and fuzzies are not generated usually by optimal. I think, for example, that designing transport systems based on increasing GDP is a wonderful solution. I can tell you in Atlanta, they don't do it. So well, my question to you is, yeah. in terms of optimizing and using big data, how are you actually going to it could drive solutions, but how can you get to the point where you said, you know, they actually use the data in a way that most of us in a room, if not all of us, would say, yeah, that's the right way of using the data, as opposed to abusing it or ignoring it? So there, there's several pieces to that question. So the part I mentioned is privacy, who controls the data, security. Um, those are questions that, you know, you need to answer before you can have the data at all. And then the next question, well, what are you going to do with it? And how are people going to understand what it is you're doing? It? And how are all the people going to be in that conversation? Because unless average people know what's happening and buy off on it, it ain't going to happen. It shouldn't probably happen. Okay? There are some things that are, um, wide, have wide agreement. For instance, when we map uh, pockets of poverty, that's so government resources can be put towards the poor pockets. Nobody complains too much about that. The buses system we did in Cote d'Ivoire, um, that was because they just had the buses in the wrong places and all these people had abnormally long commutes because they were being, because they didn't know, right? No, no real argument. When you talk about optimizing GDP in London, ah, it's controversial, right? And so the question then is how do you have policy uh, discussions? And I have a whole thing about that. It's like, how do you make smart decisions? And obviously, it involves diversity in vo uh, voices um, and things like that. But, but actually, how you make decisions is one of the key things. It's, you know, first, you need to know what the data are. Then you need to know how that relates to the things you care about and what the things you care about are. And only then can you begin making decisions about it. And you know. This is a major problem in our sort of policy. Let me go on a rant for just a second, sorry. Um, <laughs> law cannot keep up with technology. <clears throat> it's never been true. It's incredibly true now. Uh, and as a consequence, we have stupid law, outrageous, you know, uh, abusive technology, 
and general disgruntlement all around. And legislators and lawyers are beginning to understand that what you have to do is specify values, what it is you're trying to achieve, rather than how to achieve it. So there needs to be um, law that specifies, for instance, privacy or security in terms of what is the goal, not how do you do it. And then it's incumbent on people who propose solutions to show that they meet the goal. And fortunately, I think people are beginning to understand that, but we need to encourage more of that. Um, an example of a nice thing is I had lunch with the Secretary of Commerce and the EU Vice President of the Digital Market. And both of them just emphatically agreed that they could not write po uh, privacy regulation anymore, not in this age of Internet of Things and stuff like that. They had to insist that standards be met, performance standards be met, but not specify how to do it. Because they knew their organizations would never keep up with this. Uh, so, anyway, little rant. Ben Steinerman, University of Maryland. Thank you, Sandy, for a wonderful talk. You're, you're getting better all the time. I hey. really appreciate it. <laughs> wonderful. Um, I, I want to engage in the issue of the governance structure, the social mechanisms, the reward, and the motivational structures. I'm part of a steering group for NSF-supported CRA, a series of workshops starting in August about developing the research agenda for cyber social learning systems, which mm -hmm. is very aligned with what you're saying. You've been fortunate to be in organizations that gave you access and which were ready to participate, and you created that environment. But how do we create, for example, a learning health system where, you know, the the White House office, the, the Biden cancer moonshot on the day of its launch says, 17 hospitals, university hospitals, will share their data about cancer. Well, the New York Times went to them and said, not, you know, and they said, not quite. And how do we create a data to knowledge to action mechanism or governance structure which provides the right uh, encouragements for sharing data, for raising the quality of the data, and then once you have a recommendation, how do you get people to change their behavior? I see it as a large social and motivational structure. It's, a, it's a huge problem. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, <laughs> the, uh, for many years I ran a group at Davos around data um, and issues of privacy and ownership, which is very contentious. Um, and the only way we could make progress was by finding things where everybody won in the short term. I don't mean in the long term, in the short term. And you have to try and find a way to frame it where everybody says, yeah, I can tell my board of directors, you know, this spring that I'm doing this because it's good for our organization. Or I can tell the voters that I'm doing this this spring because it's good for them. And, and it has to be real, it's not BS. And sometimes that's really hard to find, um, you know, and uh, you have to get into the details. Health is particularly uh, bad because we froze it far too early. Uh, HIPAA was maybe a good idea when it was done. Now it's used as a defense against data sharing. Right. Um, the economic systems around it got set up 20, 30, 40 years ago. Now they're an impediment that shouldn't maybe have been put into uh, sort of stone. And that's this notion of building legislation that specifies achievement level rather than method. If that had been done, then people couldn't hide behind the letter of the law to prevent mm -hmm. change. Could you give us some examples that have worked where a governance structure actually got the right thing done? Um, arguably, um, the rise of the internet was something like that. I mean, there's a lot of like, well, who's paying for it? Who's yeah. going to run that? And we ended up with something that was not sclerotic, not myopic, um, had access to the whole world, 
didn't have to be that way. Yep. Right? Uh, so that's arguably a success story. Um, there are other success stories like that. But one thing with the success stories is they, if you look 20 years later, sometimes they look like not success stories. Mm -hmm. But they were good for 20 years, or yeah. 30 years, or 40 years. You gotta count that as progress. Uh, but it'd be good to be able to build structures that change, too. Good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Mark Charette from the National Institutes of Health, and could you use these systems to maximize exp exploration patterns? Exploration patterns? Yeah. I mean, we distribute billions of dollars based on primarily investigator-initiated ideas, but sometimes those ideas overlap. I mean, how could you make sure that you're maximizing your chances of exploring certain areas of biology or whatever? Um, well, uh, do it, making any change, this is one of these systems that's frozen, right? Any change is gonna be a lot of screaming and yelling and carrying on, but um, I was very interested in the, uh, uh, the IBM system, right? The Watson system. Because they were building a semantic map of all the different things that were published, right? Be interesting to ask how much funding is going into clusters that are the same old clusters in that type of a, of a system. That might be a measure. You can go much simpler models of, of uh, spread or diversity in topic. Uh, but I'd, I'd sort of think about approaching it that way, and saying, well, how could you measure the diversity of what you fund rather than uh, along with some of the existing metrics? I mean, I have never been on a study section, but many of my best friends have. Um, and it seems like they are a mechanism uh, that is uh, tuned to remove diversity. Uh, intellectual diversity. Um, and I don't mean that as a criticism, it's a political process, right? Uh, uh, and, um, you know, the, from, um, you know, look, this, at the bottom it's personal opinion, but um, yes, increasing diversity of ideas is clearly a fantastic thing to do. There's a number of ways to do it. None of them are uncontroversial. Um, you know, the way DARPA used to do it back in the good old days is they hired some of the smartest people around and they went out and found people that were doing stuff that was really different and they gave them money, full stop. Almost no proposals. Right? Actually, that's what venture capital does too, to a fair degree. You give them a 13 slide deck, they give you a million bucks. But you have to, but there's this whole sort of ecosystem of uh, finding the interesting thing and the team that will do it best and so on and so forth. So it might be good to learn from, from the venture uh, community. The best way to do that in government, incidentally, is to look and notice that the venture community is primarily aimed at reducing risk. Return with minimum risk. That's what you want to do, right? So what do they do? They have this method of vetting things to find the things that are give, likely to give maximum reward and funding them in a minimum risk manner. Uh, and I know USAID has, has copied that risk model uh, with some success. Uh, so it's possible. Yep. Good.